anyone with an Irish last name, anyone with a Gaelic Norman surname uh, feels this. The Imrva and the Villa was a literary controversy that arose in this time. It was a battle between different poets who were dealing with in literature what was happening to the aristocracy. And uh, their battles in poetry uh, lasted from 1616 to 1624. The principal participants in this were 30 bardic poets of the country writing polemical verses against each other and in support of their respective patrons. Um, so there was the Earl of Thomond, a Gaelic nobleman of the ancient O'Brien clan, who was loyal to the new order and was associated with having confiscated Clare. Um, so one of, one of the poets in the contention was named Torna Aegis, and he is criticized in poetry battles as representative Eremonian O'Neill um, by Tyg Macdara Macbruida, the Aber poet. So basically you have like O'Neill poets versus O'Brien poets. The Gaelic aristocracy was rooted in the history of Ireland that went back to 1000 AD and well back to the founding of the O'Neill dynasty um, before the coming of St. Patrick in 432 AD. And that was always rooted in the even more ancient conception of Eriman and Aber, uh, the two brothers who were the princes of Miles the Gael, who founded the Gaelic aristocracy. So you have this tremendous canon of tentious poetry as Gaelic writers are grappling with the fate of the aristocracy. One great Irish poet, Macgowan O'Hifernan, or Mahen O'Hifernan, made an interjection into this great debate in the contention of the bards, and he mocked the contestants, Louis O'Clary, who defended Tara, and Tyg Macdara, who focused on politics, with a fable about the cat and fox, Eremonians and Iberians, O'Neill and O'Briens, basically bickering over meat, giving the wolf a chance to snatch it away. So O'Hifernon's view of this was that if the O'Neill and the O'Brien continue to spar, it will give opportunity to the invaders of our country. Uh, another great scholar was St. Connor O'Devany, Connacover O'Dovany. He was a bishop and a martyr. And in 1588, uh, O'Devany was committed to Dublin Castle without conviction. He was released in 1590, protected by Hugh O'Neill. In 1612, he was tried for high treason. He was hung and quartered while alive. With him suffered Patrick O'Loughran, a priest arrested at Cork. A list of martyrs compiled. O'Devany was used by Roth in his Analecta. So we have martyrs in the early Irish saints period, like uh, St. Killian, for example, like St. Colman, who was martyred in Germany because he only spoke Irish and, and couldn't communicate to the Germans. But then we have now this, this new class of Irish saints dying as martyrs, to, trying to defend uh, Christian unity. St. Patrick O'Loughran, another priest and martyr, he administered the sacraments to exiled Irish noblemen who had fled to Belgium, but then he returned to Ireland in June of 1611, where he was arrested in Cork. Here's a poem. Kiglimon tene shalesh na farta fur padrik, na hangil a conloch na spuna e nawadi. I stoke this fire by the miracles of St. Patrick. Angels gather to ensure none douse her light. This is how what was happening was presented, that Ireland represented one of the oldest, most continuous and strongest traditions in Christendom that was begun by the authority of St. Patrick, who had created the Celtic Church of Ireland that was the great, who had missioned to the continent and had a great influence on the development of Christendom's character versus Henry VIII and his successors who were destroying this by dissolving the monasteries, murdering priests and outlawing Christian unity across the continent. Um, so the Irish perspective has always been of really St. Patrick versus Henry VIII, of St. Patrick, the bringer of Christian 
sympathy, which ended cannibalism in Ireland, versus Henry VIII, the murderer of his wives, whose institution of a new Christian religion was satanic and to be dismissed. But in this period would arise Irish Protestants who sought to understand Irish Christianity in a Protestant critique of Rome. One of the great Irish scholars of this period was James Usher, who pretended to be the successor of St. Patrick in the Protestant faith, which is impossible. But he established a chronology from creation uh, starting in 4004 BC, and he condemned Charles Coote for extremism. He was one of the, the planters, and, and the Coots were an important family. O'Carolan would write an ode to the Coots in exchange for patronage. And he wrote a discourse on the religion anciently professed by the Irish in 1622 because he was highly influenced by the Celtic church and the claims of successorship. And so you have this the beginning of the Protestant fascination with the Celtic church as a source of their own authority rather than rooting it in Henry VIII. And so the war between St. Patrick and Henry VIII starts to be resolved a little bit by uh, Protestants such as Usher, who sought St. Patrick again as a source of their own faith. And of course, this is happening in, in the time of the plantation of Ulster, when uh, Scottish refugees were uh, given lands that were not theirs. Um, starting in around 1609. The land confiscations uh, were accompanied by atrocities and resentment as the prelude uh, to the uprising of 1641. So some of the plantations became fortified towns and the confiscation included uh, terrible atrocities by the planters against the population that owned the land. This concludes part two of a history of early modern Ireland from Prince O'Neill to Robert Emmett, 1580 to 1803. For part three, there's a third video.